unto men. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. His love has no his grace has no measure, his power has no boundary, no none to man. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth. Amen. 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 What a powerful promise. Now, I'm going to pick someone to read us the scripture for today. And I see Noella. I think Noella, Noella's birthday is in these days. Uh, happy birthday, Noella. Could you read for us? Uh, let, let's let's hear Noella. Noella, can you hear me? Okay. Maybe far. Let me pick someone else. Petra. Donna. Where are these people? Okay, let's see. How about, happy Sabbath, Sharon. Happy day. Okay, uh, finally. <laughs> uh, could, you, <laughs> could you please read for us the book of Proverbs, mm -hmm. chapter 13, uh, from the book of Proverbs, chapter 13, verse 22. Yes, I'll be happy to, let me find it. Thank you, Proverbs 13, verse 22. Okay, Proverbs 13, verse 22 from the New King James Version says, A good man leaves an inheritance to his children, to his children's children, but the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. Thank you so much. Sharon, he's going to speak to us uh, about the, the topic that we chose, I believe, uh, it's about four months ago uh, about this interesting topic of uh, managing our finances. And Isaac has, has been addressing this subject with a passion. He is a personal finance management professional, and he is passionate about financial literacy, training, and coaching. And he does this with an emphasis on self-regulation and teamwork. And he has, uh, as I said, five years, uh, over five years experience in, this same, in the same subjects. And he also has several years experience in counseling and management, as well as a particular focus on entrepreneurship. So we, we are really pleased that Isaac accepted our invitation and he is ready to speak to us. And as he said, uh, he's, he's willing to be on a journey of learning and exploration with us. Uh, he will speak to us and then we will have a time for uh, questions and, and discussion. And um, Isaac is, is, is a married man and we are happy to have him here. Welcome, Isaac. Thank you, um, Elder, for that generous um, welcoming message. Thank you all for attending this uh this hour uh, i understand we are scattered from all over it's not just uh um 
youth from from KEC or from Kigali, but from all over the place. I wonder how many different places, different, maybe different cities that are represented or different countries that are represented here today, other than uh, Rwanda itself, where we are hosting. Pastor Santenga, thank you very much for the invitation. I am honored always to speak uh, with fellow believers about this very, very important subject, very close to my heart, but also uh, what happens to be a quite a biblical subject, uh, even though it's not always recognized as such. Subject of money um, is, is often in certain circles, not everywhere, but the subject of money is often put aside and uh, in, 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 in when discussing matters of faith or matters of spirituality, money is usually in my experience at a side, but uh, maybe that's not everywhere in every case. Um, and I really hope that uh, we can be part of a conversation that continues to make money as a topic, um, one that is incorporated and welcomed within the body of believers. I do wonder, I see that we are a good number, 49, almost 50 um, participants. I'm not a teacher, so, or a preacher for that matter. So I will have a very hard time looking at names on a screen uh, and, and, uh, and maintaining a line of, 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 uh, of conversation when just looking at my own reflection. Uh, so I'll ask, uh, maybe I can see the chat box. Great, I can see the chat box we have. Um, we have uh, somebody from the USA, we have Uganda, Kampala, uh, UK, we have Luanda, Angola. That's fantastic. Anywhere else represented here? Um, any country that you're logging in from? Not necessarily the country that you're from, but where you're logging in from, that, that's always fantastic to see you. Those who could put on their videos so that I don't get shy by looking at names only. If you can, please put on your video. I hope to have as interactive a session as possible. Um, uh, and, and you know, when you're, you're saying things that people don't agree with, I don't understand, usually their face changes. Their eyebrows frown, the head, they start shaking their head, even if the, the sound is off. So at least you can see maybe there's something that I'm saying that is not going over well with my brothers and sisters in faith. So I can maybe uh, try to backtrack and make sure we are coming together. Um, I think that before we go anywhere, uh, after thanking Pastor uh, Santenga for the for the invite, maybe I can ask uh, ask him to lead us in a word of prayer. Uh, thank you very much, Isaac. I think let's let's, let's close our eyes. Well, yeah, is a very important uh, topic we have today. I mean, a gentleman in this question, we need to pray for him because he's just a presenting Christ in presenting to us tonight. So whatever he says, let's be useful to us. Let's humble ourselves for our word prayer. Our Father and our God, we want to thank you so much for this beautiful uh, uh, Sabbath evening in some places and Sabbath morning in some places and the afternoon in others. Father, this is the last Sabbath of the year. We pray that we pray for our presenter tonight, uh, Isaac, uh, Brother Isaac Ngosi. The topic he's going to present about finances and money this is a very major presentation because many of us are affected with what goes on around regarding our funds and our finances in these difficult times where people are laid off from work, where people are on furrow and others are looking for jobs. Father, guide him, use him as an instrument of instruction. Let your will be done so that by the end of the presentation, we have all gained you in this presentation. Let your will be done in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Amen and amen. Thank you very much uh, for that word. I love to talk about money. Before I jump into my presentation, I can see that there are a few more people who have thrown in where they're um, tuning in from or, or signing in from. We have Luanda Angola, I think I mentioned that one already, Tanzania. Um, oh, um, we have Uganda from, uh, from one of my elders is joining us from Uganda. Um, Elder and Uncle Vincent, uh, thank you very much for joining us. Um, it's always good to know that you have people, your people joining you. So if the videos are not uh, 
if it's not possible turn in your video, please feel free to keep your video off. But we'll try to make this as interactive as possible because we're talking about money and money can be a tough subject. It can cause us to be a little bit shy and reserved. But remember, again, we are talking um, uh, in a, in, within the body of faith. So we are trying to, like Pastor has mentioned, we're trying to uplift each other. There, this is a difficult time. I actually don't know if there's a more appropriate time to talk about a subject like money other than now. The last week, uh, last Sabbath of, of the last uh, uh, week of, the, of, of 2020, uh, an, 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 an impossibly, an unimaginably difficult year. Uh, many people are, many the world over, people are suffering with this particular subject of money. And so the more that we engage, the more that we will learn ourselves, including me, and the more we have an opportunity to share uh, our, our, our thoughts and bless somebody else who might not have a contribution that you have that is on your heart to share so if if you feel burdened on your heart to share something please do but when i talk about money uh particularly the first thing i'd like to discuss is is uh is talking about how we can get in control of our personal finance resource how is it that we might control our money i hope my share screen is up and you can see it uh, we've just looked at this uh, verse, I believe that Sharon is the one who read out to us. Uh, Proverbs 13, 22 states that a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children, but the wealth of a sinner, sinner is soon laid up for the righteous. What does this verse mean? I know it's not the first time many of you have, have seen it, uh, interacted with it, but what does it mean to you that a good man or good person would leave. I think other vers versions say wise. Uh, a wise man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. Um, but the wealth of a sinner is soon laid up for the righteous or stored up for the righteous. What does it mean to anyone? I don't know if Sharon wants to jump in or anyone else. What does it mean to you, this verse? I can jump in. I feel like I had never really, this this verse jumped up to me in a new way. I don't think I had ever really read it. But um, yesterday evening, I was having a conversation with my brother and he was saying how um, a lot of the kid, uh, I guess the colleagues that he went to school with, um, who have like big last names, <laughs> it was usually the grandfather. Um, that made it and thus left an inheritance for the grandchildren. Um, and now, you know, the name is still continuing because of the work of the grandfather. So when I read this verse, it reminded me of that um, instance that, mm. you know, right now we don't necessarily work to leave, you know, um, stuff for our children, but we work even more to leave, um, you know, something for our grandchildren. So that's pretty impressive that the Bible would give us such wise counsel. And like you were saying, um, Brother Isaac, that this is not something that we hear a lot in the church and I'm very grateful that we get to learn today. Amen, Sister Sharon. I think that, that again, like we've said, it is not a very common theme to discuss amongst uh, believers, at least not in church, but this is a critically important subject and, and one that God, Christ himself, took quite seriously in his time teaching on earth. He, he mentioned money, I think uh, the, the subject of money in his uh, um, parables and in his teachings came up among, if not the most uh, subject brought up uh, was money. Uh, among the top three, or at least maybe someone will correct me, maybe even the most often brought up subject uh, in his teachings was money, uh, or at least involved money. Um, does anyone want to sh throw out a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children? Anyone want to throw out that? Why would that be uh, good? Why would that be called good?
anyone with a contribution, an idea, before I roll on. I know we are limited for time, so I won't hold too long, but I do want to see if we can interact a bit. Somebody unmuted themselves. Well, I, I can say something when, you know, when, when I read, when I read the Bible, I like to find out, you know, who the author was and who he was writing to. But we all know that the book of Proverbs were, was written by the wisest man that ever lived. And this wisdom, he did not obtain from, you know, Harvard or MIT. It was given by God. And so I just like to think that the, the wisdom that is in Solomon's books is, is really packed with wisdom from God. So this is God inspired and God is teaching us to really not just work uh, from day to day or hand to mouth, but to have a culture of saving for future generations and whatever we do uh, <coughs> that we just not focus on the use for now, uh, but also looking at what future generations uh, are going to have. So I, I, I just think this is, this is one of the quotations of the wisest man that ever lived who got wisdom directly from heaven. Amen, Aldo. Thank you very much for that contribution. Uh, we are talking about the wisest man who ever lived. And I do see that we have a couple of contributions on our chat box. Uh, I, I did uh, forget to, to pay some attention to there. We, I see that we have, we have someone, come, uh, someone who's logged on from, from Niger. Um, somebody else uh, contributed by saying, to me, it does not necessarily be money i think to me to this person it doesn't necessarily mean money it can also be knowledge or wisdom um and yes knowledge and wisdom can be passed down uh can be inherited uh but particularly an inheritance is a is a function of wealth um uh, and, and in this in this um biblical text the author, the, the writer, the, the, the wise man is particularly talking about um, actual wealth, actual inheritance. Um, and, and the message here that I draw from this is that there is a wisdom, there is a air quote goodness inherent in the habit of thinking beyond your generation, in your own family, in your own family. There is an inherent wisdom and inherent uh, righteousness that comes from with the use and um, application of the money resource you have, of the wealth resource you have, to think not only for yourself, but to also think for the well being and the wealth of your children. But even not enough to think only about your children but to think about the wealth and well-being of the children that follow them. A good man, a righteous man, leaves an inheritance for his children's children. But the wealth of a sinner is soon laid up for the righteous. The wealth of a sinner is soon laid up for the righteous. That one seems a bit more cryptic to me. The wealth of a sinner is soon laid up for the righteous. The Bible seems to be, or Solomon seems to be, saying that um, sinners are soon parted from their wealth. Sinners are, uh, in our modern age, we have all kinds of sayings about, um, about uh, fools and their money soon parting ways, about ill-gotten gains, they don't last. Uh, you know, when, when, you, when you acquire money, uh, in, in, in some kind of suspicious or unethical manner, usually that doesn't last very long. If you're into illegal activities, usually that prosperity doesn't last long. And so the wealth of the sinner is soon laid up for the righteous. And for me, this makes a significant uh, impact uh, when 
I was first um, exposed to a reflection on this text. The good man leaves an inheritance for his. What is my agenda with, for the inheritance of my children and theirs? Do I even have a plan for my own next three months for myself, let alone the inheritance of my child? I'm not an old man whose child should be looking forward to an inheritance let alone somebody who's planning for his grandchildren. But yet the wise man is saying that to be one of the elements of being called good or righteous, uh, at least as far as this earth is concerned, is that one of the qualifications is that we are leaving an inheritance for our children's children. Um, I'll move on from here. When I talk about personal finance, one of the first things that I like to address is how we can, as individuals, gain more control of our money resource. How can we gain more control of our money resource? How can I control my money? Do I control my money? Does my money control me? Um, like uh, Elder David uh, mentioned earlier, uh, I am very passionate in the field of, of financial literacy, particularly um, personal money management. Your, our ability to manage our own financial resource, our, uh, our ability to be good stewards of what we have. And we'll talk about stewardship a little bit later um, in, this, in this session. I'll try to be swift so we have enough time to interact. So within the next hour, I'll be done with what we're, we'll be discussing. And we'll have a little bit of an exercise uh, a little bit later as well um, to, to, to try to find ways to apply what it is that we are discussing in today's session about controlling your money generally. That's a general theme. Now, when I talk about controlling money, I like referring to a story, a story from the book by uh, a bestseller, you might know it, an international bestseller. It's a very old book. It's called The Richest Man in Babylon. It's a fictional story, but it's set in a few thousand years ago in uh, the kingdom of Babylon, where um, the king at the time, again, it's a fictional story, but the king at the time is very, very um, concerned with the overall wealth and long-standing wealth of his nation. At the time, Babylon is already the wealthiest nation in the known world. And, uh, and the king at the time is looking to supplant or to, um, to cement Babylon's status as the wealthiest nation in the world. And to do this, what he does is he tries to identify the wealthiest individual person in Babylon. And as he does so, he identifies that there's a person by the name of Arkad, who is known as the richest man in Babylon. And as he identifies this man, his next step is to go out and invite Arkad to come to the palace to have a meeting with the king. And so he sends out an invitation to Arkad, the richest man in Babylon. And Arkad is invited to the palace and he graciously accepts the invitation to meet with the king. And a few short days later, after the invite is received, Arkad approaches the, the palace and is welcomed in to meet with the king for this pressing matter the king wishes to discuss with the richest man in Babylon, named Arkad. In their conversation, the richest, uh, the king asks Arkad, how is it that you have become the wealthiest man in the land? I did some research on you. I understand that your father is not a wealthy person. You did not have, uh, you did not come from wealth. You were not born in wealth. How did you become the richest man in Babylon? And Arkad responds to the king and he says, uh, my king, I became wealthy by following 
uh, the advice and the mentorship of a wealthy uh, mentor who took me under his wing to teach me how I might become wealthy as well. And the king is very pleased by this response because the king wants to know if you learned how to become wealthy, how is it possible for you to teach others how to become wealthy as well? And Arquette says, if I learned how to do it, I'm sure anyone can learn how to do it as well. And the king is very delighted. So the king says, now I have a responsibility for you. I'm going to select 100 men. And of those 100 men, you will teach them how to become wealthy. And their responsibility is, will be to apply what you teach and then go out and teach even more how to do what they have done, what you have taught them. So you will, I will identify 100 men for you to teach. You will go out and teach them in my palace. I have a, a great place you will study and uh, teach these men how to, to be, grow their wealth. And then when they are done and they have practiced what you've taught them, they will continue by teaching others. Our cat says, I am more than willing to, to serve my king in the way that my king requires. So the king very pleased goes out and does his responsibility, identifies handpicked 100 men uh, from different um, professions, different spaces, but sharp men, uh, and their responsibility to come and learn from Arcad how they can grow their own wealth. While Arcad is addressing these men in one of his lectures, one of the participants, the men in the crowd, has a question of the things that he's learning from Arkad. And he raises his hand and he says, Mr. Arkad, Mr. Trainer, Mr. Facilitator, Mr. Teacher, I have a question. His question is, how is it that I might be able to save 10% of my income when I have no money left after all my monthly necessary expenses are paid. I pay for all the things I need in the month. And when I'm done, the money is, is too little to pay for the things I need. How can I, you've advised us to save 10% of what we make in order to use that 10% for our financial growth, for the development of our finances, for the furthering of our wealth. But I don't think you understand, Mr. Arcade. You're the wealthiest man in the, in, the, in the land. I think that since you have so much money, you don't really understand the reality on the ground. So many of us, we don't have enough money to pay for normal day-to-day -day expenses. How can somebody save 10% if we don't have enough money at the end of the month just to pay for our necessary expenses? And so the, the classroom is in a bit of a murmur now. People in different areas of the class are, are just uh, chatting amongst themselves, murmuring, whispering. Uh, it seems that this participant has touched on a, a, a point that others share. How can we save 10% of what we make if at the end of the month, when I, we are done paying for our necessary expenses, we don't have enough money even just to cover them. It's not realistic. Saving is not a realistic activity. After the class quiets down a little bit, Arkad decides to answer this participant's question with a question of his own. Generally, very bad manners. When somebody asks you a question, you don't answer with a question also. But this is Arkad's class and he's running his class. So he asks a question of his own. He asked a question to the class. How many of you in this classroom, how many of you have a thin wallet? More or less, how many of you are broke? And the class goes now into a full roar. People start laughing and uh, awkwardly raising their purses in the sky and shaking their purses in the air with their hands raised up, indicating that they also have a thin wallet. And they shake their purses because this is uh, several thousand years ago. They don't have uh, credit cards and debit cards. They have gold coins and silver coins. So they shake their purses to, you can hear the few coins, the few ijanas tinkling in there. 
uh, to prove how thin their wallets are. Uh, and of course, now the class is even in more of a roar than it was before. And, uh, and Arcad has to wait a few moments for the class to quiet down again, for him to further his line of questions. How is it when the class quiets down? How is it that in a room with a hundred men, each of these men, you have different jobs. Some of you are doctors, some of you are lawyers, some of you are engineers, some of you are handymen, some of you make um, thatch houses, some of you uh, are farmers. How is it that even though you have different uh, employ employment, different jobs, you do different, you're in different fields, you have different sizes of family. Some of you are, are, are single, some of you are married, some of you have many children, some of you take care of extended family. You have different size of family, you have different expenses, you have different levels of income. How is it that everyone is equally broke at the end of the month? How is that possible? Does anyone have an answer, an idea of how that's possible? How a hundred men of different occupations different incomes, different family sizes, <clears throat> different expenses. How is it that they're equally broke by the end of the month? Should they be broke? At some, some have this much, some have this much, some have this much, some have nothing, somebody have le less. Why are we equally broke at the end of the month? Anyone with a, a contribution, uh, a guess, an insight? Um, let me see if I can jump onto my chat box as well. Uh, um, they don't budget, maybe. Maybe they don't budget. That could be a uh, one of the reasons. Um, spending, somebody says, Betty says spending. What do you mean by spending? Maybe you can elaborate more. Or somebody else can also jump in. What is spending? Mm -hmm. Who spends a lot of money? All those men spend a lot of money than they get, maybe. All the people are spending a lot more money than they get. Thank you very much, Betty. Somebody says, I guess it could be due to poor budgeting. Somebody else says, I think that they have different amounts of money, but I don't know if there's a level of brokenness. <laughs> they all seem to be equally broke. Huh? Uh, that's a problem problematic. They have the same mentality. What does that mean, Emmanuel? Same mentality. The income is low. That's very possible. They could, some could have low income, but, but some, they, remember these are people who are picked by the king. These are not anyone. The king knows them. And by the time the king knows you, you must be at least somewhere. But it's possible that they, I don't think they can all have a low income, but maybe some have a low income. Uh, hey, Isaac, uh, just a comment here. Doesn't really de depend on the amount of income. A, a common pattern, what you see in the world is that even though people, even though people get a pay raise, they will still have the same bad habit of spending. So they'll just increase their spending. Absolutely. Uh, thank you both, Chris, both Chris and uh, who else? I, I believe it was um, gave the same contribution, Betty, about spending. Excellent contributions right on the proverbial money, spending habits. They have many expenses. The spending culture was contagious. They had no savings culture. That comes from, it's from David. Income. So what Arcad says is the reason, just like Chris contributed, the reason why we are equally broke is that what each of us call necessary expenses tends to grow to match our incomes. That's Arcad's answer, why this is. What each of us call necessary expenses tends to grow to match our income. When I made 100,000, when I made 50,000, I was spending 60,000. 
When I made 100,000, I was spending 110,000. When I made uh, 300,000, I'm spending 400,000. When I make 500,000, I'm spending 700,000. When I make 2 million, I'm spending 3 million. So the reality is for most of us, at least according to ARCAD, unless we actively refuse to let it be like this, our income, our expenses tend to rise, to grow and match our income. Our expenses tend to grow to match our income unless we purposefully refuse to let it be like that. The natural tendency, the natural, let me, since I'm talking to believers, the natural iniquity. You don't have to teach a child to be selfish. It comes naturally. Mm. You don't have to teach a human being to serve themselves. It is natural. It is a result of what the first Adam did and Eve. It is also our natural tendency to raise our expenses every time to match or even increase our income. It is natural to us unless we actively refuse to let it be so. The wealth of a sinner is soon laid up for the righteous. Why is somebody righteous when they leave an inheritance for their children's children? What does that have to do with righteousness? Unless we are battling, unless we actively refuse to allow this natural inclination, that natural tendency to consume equal or more than what we earn, mm -hmm. then we will always, somebody's making, a, somebody, you finished university. I remember somebody when I did a training uh, several years ago, I will not say who or where because the person might recognize their story. But somebody mentioned to me when I did training at, a, at an office, some, uh, I think it was 2017. He told me, you know, I just joined this office several months ago. And uh, when, I, when I got my first salary, I got my first salary, uh, I got this job right out of university. And when I finished, I was so happy to get to this job, of course. Uh, and it is, a, it is a good company that he's working for. And he said, when I got my first salary, it was a Friday. I got my first salary on a Friday. And, and, uh, and I really enjoyed, I was so excited to have my first salary. But, but by Monday, I had to ask for transport to go to work. Now, I don't tell his story to, to, to make fun of this person, um, but, but it's a reality that so many of us, when we make our first salary uh, or, or when we make our salary, we, we immediately tend to spend, to celebrate. Celebrating is not wrong. There's nothing wrong with celebrating. But really, you, you, you get your first salary and you celebrate until the point you have no money to go to work the following, the following week. That is the urge to spend and enjoy and consume what we have. Right? And so generally speaking, when you get your, when you're first living in a, in a place of, of, of a house of 25,000 and you get a, 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 a new job, which is double your pay, you might tell yourself, I can't continue living in a house of 25,000 a month when I have a, I've doubled my salary. Surely I should also move to somewhere that reflects my new social status. Hmm? When you get promoted to a, a new position and you say, no, I used to, I used to, to use a public means. Now, at least I should be able to hire a private. Uh, I should be using my mobile apps to order, to order rides. I can't be using a, a bus anymore. When you are driving a small um, Vitz, at a new promotion, you say, no, no, I can't still driving this Vitz. Surely a, a, a professional like me needs to have at least a car which is uh, somewhere from Germany. 
because I have to look. I have to be perceived at the level that I am. I am. And so unless we actively refuse to let it be so, our income, sorry, our expenses generally rise. They grow to meet our, meet our incomes. Peer pressure is real and everyone has a propensity to show off. It really is. Thank you, David. I think that's very, very true. I also go for, as far as, for us to say, peer pressure and appearances are the death of financial progress. Peer pressure and appearances, how it looks, how it looks, how does it look that I drive this car? How does it look that I'm not, uh, I'm not in this neighborhood? Others in our church live in this neighborhood. How is it that I'm not there? Am I saying I'm not like on the same level of other church members? Peer pressure and appearances, looking successful is the death of actual financial success. To look successful, to look wealthy, it's the death of real wealth and real financial success at least. Appearances are very dangerous if we're, they are not checked. Um, there may be they all had no, no one to change their culture of poverty. That's very possible because poverty being broke is just not having money. Being impoverished is a mentality. It's a culture. Impoverished. And the, I can be so bold to say it, is that because it's not only wealthy people who become financially successful. There are very many wonderful stories. Of course, certain things need to be aligned and, and there's blessings of God involved. But there's so many stories of people who become financially, who are on the path of financial success, who come from very humble beginnings. And it's a mentality. Success is a point of view. Financial success is a point of view. We should never confuse necessary expenses with desires is what Arkad, the richest man in Babylon, continues to say. The reason why our expenses rise to meet our, meet our income is because we confuse necessary expenses with desires. What is the difference between a necessary expense and a desire? Does anyone have an idea? Maybe you can throw it in the chat box or you can unmute yourself. Is there, what is the difference between a necessary expense and a desire? Anyone with an idea? Again, I told you I don't like being by myself. I'm shy. So if I'm talking and no one is joining me, I become very shy. Uh, we need to know the difference between needs and wants. Thank you, David. That's very true. David S. For me, necessary expense is a basic need. Necessary expense are basic needs. What are basic needs? You have replaced one phrase with another phrase. Necessary expense means a basic need. Okay, what's a basic need? Fred, Thierry, what are basic needs? Uh, water, shelter, food, fantastic, ETC. Things that without primary needs, if you don't have these things, survival is very difficult or, or you can't survive at all. Basic needs are those we need something you can't do without. Yeah, but somebody will tell you, I can't do without my, my iPhone SX. I cannot do without it. If I don't have my iPhone SX, I will die. Mm -hmm. Somebody, I saw a video on, on, uh, on YouTube about a, a young woman crying that her Instagram was switched off. And she said, my whole life is over. My life is finished. I have no Instagram. That's my whole world is over. How do you close my Instagram? Yes. So what does that mean? Uh, we can't do without it. What does it mean not to do without it? Uh, let me see if I can keep ahead of this chat. The chat box is flying now. Um, water, shelter, food, basic needs for survival. Yes, theory, basic needs for survival. Yes. We, we use to learn that basic needs is something you can't do without. Uh -huh. David, you're taking us back to things we can't do without. I said somebody said their life is over without Instagram. So they can't do without Instagram. Is Instagram a basic need? What can we do without? Can you do without Instagram? Uh, it's about food, drinks, shelter, clothes. Okay. 
So I think we have made that point. Uh, okay. <laughs> yes, you said you, basic needs according to Maslow's hierarchy of needs. <laughs> yeah, somebody, somebody studied some psychology there or sociology. Uh, hierarchy of needs. Huh? Uh, food, shelter, sleep. Um, uh, I can't remember what the pyramid is. It's a pyramid of the needs. But things that either, if you didn't have, you could not survive. If you don't have these things, you will not stay alive. Or staying alive becomes very difficult. Those are needs. You can't stay alive without them or staying alive becomes very difficult. Necessary could be something that will continue to make you more money. Say rental property. Hmm. Uh, necessity could be something that will continue to make you more money. We'll talk about this a little bit later, Collins, but uh, a rental property might not be a need. I, I wouldn't qual qualify that as a need, but we'll, we'll come to properties later uh, before we are done. Um, but going back to the story, Arkad says that each of us and our families possess so many more desires than our money can satisfy. He goes on to say, all people are burdened with having more desires than their money can satisfy. All people. He says, all people, everywhere, everyone has more desires than their money can satisfy. Everyone has that burden. I have these desires, but my money cannot satisfy them or their resource can't satisfy them. And some of the class in our house is possible. Arkad is the richest person in Babylon. How can rich people not be able to satisfy their desires? And so Arkad continues. He says, even me, the richest man in Babylon, I am, cannot satisfy all my desires. He says, there's a limit to how far I can travel, especially if you consider the time that he's reflecting on. He says, there's a limit to the time he has. He says he loves to eat, but there's a limit to how much food he can consume, even if he can buy all the food that you can imagine. There's a, there's, there's a limit to how much he can put in his stomach. Ultimately, he says, there's a limit to how much I can squeeze the joy, the juice out of life. I'm limited in the juice I can squeeze out of life. And so Arkad continues to say, but when you appreciate that you cannot have everything that you want, even you can't have most of the things that you want, then you put yourself in the right mental state to focus on what you need first, because without what you need, staying alive becomes difficult. Without what you need, staying alive becomes impossible. For you and for those who rely on you, staying alive becomes difficult. If you can't put food on the table, then staying alive becomes difficult. If you can't stay sheltered, then staying healthy and alive becomes difficult. Staying safe becomes difficult. Having good sleep becomes difficult. If you can't find work to do, it's difficult to, to, to continue meeting your needs and to facilitate doing that work. And if we focus on our needs and then some of our wants, we get ourselves closer. We become what they call temperate with our spending. And we put ourselves in a position to succeed financially. That was Arkad's story. His story was, in order to become financially secure, one of the things, the first things we have to do is understand that one-tenth of what we make needs to be set aside for ourselves, for our financial future. Paying ourselves first is what he described. And in order to set a tenth of what you earn aside, we must first begin to appreciate the difference between what you need and what you want. Never allow your 
your desires to be confused with expenses or necessary expenses and needs and then build a habit of consistently paying yourself a tenth of everything you earn. And I think the idea of a tenth is not strange. We have heard of a tenth before, especially as Christians. A tenth. The first tenth that we owe or that we, we must consider when we are paid is the tenth that belongs to the Lord. And after that, it's a percentage that belongs to, to the work of God based on our, our willingness to give. The first tenth is an offering, uh, sorry, a tithe, a tithe, a tenth that belongs to God. The next is a percentage that you wish to return to God because of the way he has blessed you. That's called an offering. Now, it's not necessarily a tenth. That percentage is up to you. But the third percentage that you want to consider is a tenth that you pay to yourself. And we'll talk a bit about that before we are done. But before we jump into anything else, I want to talk about seven essential financial terms for you, for me, for all of us as individuals. If we understand these essential financial terms, we're in a better position to control our money. To control our money. If you have any questions, please, please feel free to, to throw them into the chat box because I'm going to move a bit swiftly um, as we go into this second hour of our session. Seven financial terms begin. The first financial term is asset. And I borrowed the definition that is written in Robert Kiyosaki's um, Rich Dad, Poor Dad, where he says, an asset is something that puts money in your pocket. And I add the word regularly. It regularly puts money in your pocket. An asset, something that is independent of you. Something that is not you, that puts money regularly in your pocket. That's an asset, a financial asset, a personal finance asset. I don't know if we have any accountants on the call. Because if we did, I'm pretty sure, anyone who's an accountant or who has studied accounting, who, who can give us another definition of uh, of asset. <laughs> uh, I, I really like this definition because it makes it very simple and clear what the parameters are for an asset for an individual. Something that puts money in your pocket. Does anyone have an example? What exa what's an example of an asset? Land. Someone can throw the chat book. Land, maybe. Yeah. Maybe, maybe, not necessarily, not always, maybe. Somebody else? A rental property. Rental, rental property. property, maybe, maybe land, maybe rental property, maybe. Why am I not so sure? But maybe it can be, land can be an asset, maybe. An investment. Rental property can so some say investment, somebody else, I think David was going to say something else. My uh -huh. ability to work. Ability to work. No, that's not a financial asset because it's still you. You want something that's not you. Something that's not your person. That, so you are not a financial asset for yourself. <laughs> So it has to be something outside of you, something, a thing that puts money in your pocket, not you. So I said that is an, not a, an investment, it can be small or big. Yes. An investment. A book you authored, interesting. A book that you authored, Colin says, something that we call, okay, something that you, a book that you authored that you're selling, I'm assuming, Collins, you're saying a book that you authored and you sell might be an asset probably what about shares i think they're assets theory yes maybe generally speaking generally speaking yes i mean it it all it all depends on uh, if it produces a positive flow of income and a rental property is a great suggestion but 
again, it has to have uh, a regular tenant that gives you money each month. If that doesn't happen, it's not an asset. If you have shares, it needs to produce money each month for it to be an asset. And if you write a book, it, I mean, the publication costs lead, need to be less than the actual income that you're getting. Again, thank you very much. Chris has really hit the nail on the hammer, on the wood, and 100%. <laughs> <laughs> it is an asset if it generates money for you. And I, I, really, I, I really emphasize that if. So one of the reasons why land generally is not a personal finance asset. If I talk with an accountant, an accountant, if there's any accountant on this call, I'm sure we are going to, he's going to, he or she will fight with me. Because for an accountant, anything that has value and can be resold is an asset especially if it contributes to the functioning of whatever organization uh, uh, it's owned by. But for you as an individual, and, and all my definitions are going to apply to you as an individual, we need to be able to define certain things the right way in order to use them the way they need to be used for our success. The way we define a thing determines how we use it. The way you define something depends on, informs the way you use it. So an asset needs to be something that gives you money on a regular basis. Just as Chris, uh, Brother Chris has mentioned um, with his contribution. Uh, a rental property like land or like a, a house, it's an asset if it's bringing you money than more money than it's costing you. you on your rental property you pay maintenance fees to to maintain your your property you pay taxes on your property you pay repairs uh, you 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 are ultimately liable for this piece of property if something happens to it it's ultimately on you so property take money from you properties take money from you but if you're property is being rented at a rate which is higher than the, the cost of maintaining that property, then your rental property is an asset. Let me paint a picture for you that's similar to what Brother Chris has, uh, Christopher has, has shared. What if I have a property that it, 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 uh, has a loan against it at the bank? The loan is costing me 500,000 francs every month and the house is, has no tenant. There's no one living in the house. Somebody come to me last month and said, this house, I want to rent it from you. And, and I said, okay, my price is 2 million francs per month. And they say, ah, I can't afford 2 million. I'll give you uh, 1.5 million. And you say, no, my house is 2 million. If you don't want to give me 2 million, please go somewhere. Don't insult me with your offer of 1.5 million. My house is 2 million a month. So I'm paying 500,000 to the bank every month for my mortgage, but my house has no one renting it. What is that house according to this definition? Is it an asset? It's a liability. <laughs> Who was that? Somebody says, somebody, well, Denise says no. Somebody said it was a liability. And yes, it's firmly a liability because it is taking 500,000 francs from me every month. It is costing, it's taking money away from me. It's doing the opposite of an asset. So we have to be careful. Just because you have a house doesn't mean you have an asset. Just because you have land doesn't mean you have an asset. Just because you have some uh, financial instrument, like uh, Brother Christopher was saying, just because you have a financial asset uh, instrument doesn't mean it's an asset, unless it is producing money that is giving you every month, or uh, regularly, it doesn't have to be giving you every month, but regularly giving you money, that's when it's an asset. It's, it's the, the, the flow of money to you is more than the flow of money going away from your, from your pocket. That, is an asset. We cannot afford 
to call something an asset when it is not one. Because, ah, I have to buy that Mercedes Benz. If I buy that Mercedes Benz and people can see that I have a Mercedes Benz, it's a real asset. How? Does that Mercedes Benz pay you anything? Does it give you any money? No, somebody will say, no, there's somebody on the street who will know that I drive Mercedes Benz. Then they'll say, give me a job. That's, <laughs> that's very dangerous logic because it can, it can take you 10 years for somebody to see you in that Mercedes Benz. And by the time they see the Mercedes Benz and give you up, they might find out later that uh, the Mercedes Benz that you have is more valuable than the work you do. And then you lose the job. It's not your car that gives you a job. It's not your car that gives you uh, status. It's your productivity. It's your relationship with God and with others that make you productive. So I'm sure somebody will have some comment or a question or an objection in the chat box. Please go ahead and throw it there. By, def by, by observation, somebody says in the chat box, uh, the Mercedes could be an Uber X, which earns you more. The a car, assuming that it is rented and the money generates from the rent rental is more than what it's costing you plus depreciation, then it's an asset. So anything really can be an asset. But it's only an asset if what it gives you is greater than what it takes from you in terms of finance. Is there a question? I, I hear somebody has unmuted themselves. Hi, they, Isaac. I have a question. Um, yep. So there's some things that are like collectible items. So say, yep. for example, the modern day generation. So say like Yeezys. These are trainer sneakers. So like yeah. Yeezys, Jordans um rolexes um vintage wines or like some alcohols where you can you can trade them so the the, the value that you bought them at is always going to be higher like uh like either six months or within a certain amount of time or even straight away would that be classified or would that fall under the the maybes for the assets because i don't know if it's going to be regular but you can, you can trade them. I guess it's like the stocks anyway, it falls in the same thing that you can trade them at a higher price or even well, rent them. And I don't think the value will go down. They only go up. Well, well let's, let's, let's take a few examples. Let's take maybe the Yeezys that you mentioned, which, uh, okay. And then you also talked about, I think, did you, did you mention alcohols? So like yeah, like, so there's particular wines. there's particular drinks or particular wines that right. if you keep them for longer, they mature as in yeah the, yeah they mature and they get uh they cost you a lot more. So say like Rolexes as well. So you might have a vintage Rolex or Jordans or so Air Jordans. They're sneakers by uh, Michael Jordan. Like the later the later ones, like one of the ones that he first came out with. If you try and buy them now, they're more expensive than what they were before. Supply and demand, right? Uh, it's a very excellent observation, David. Now, I'll also throw in land itself. There is a particularly tricky, um, I'm not gonna call them asset classes because I wouldn't qualify them as assets, but a, a tricky set of valuable items that can be confused with assets. And you, you kind of touched on the answer in your question. Uh, you said they, you can probably sell them for more than what you got them for, but then you also mentioned you're probably not gonna get regular, the word regular is, doesn't apply. So for example, when you have a collector's item, I have something that I bought, make it simple, anyone can on the call can relate, a plot of land. You buy a plot of land for uh, I'll just use dollars in this example because we might be able to relate to dollars across the different nations that we're in. Um, you buy a plot of land for $10,000. Uh, 10 years ago, uh, in 2010, and this is 2020, 10 years later, you sell that plot of land for $30,000. Was that plot of land an asset? Well, I'll say no. It's not an asset. What has happened is you've got yourself a capital gain. You had a capital of $10,000. You put it, invested in a plot of land 
and that capital increased from ten thousand dollars to thirty thousand dollars when you sold that valuable item. But there is no regularity in this in this transaction. You had something of value, and then you sold something of value. But you don't have an asset now. If you have a business which collects assets and regularly sells them at a profit, then your business is an asset because it's ge regularly generating an income for you. Things like land, somebody says, look, I bought this land at $10,000 and now the valuer says it is worth $30,000. Do I have $30,000 now that the valuer says it's worth $30,000? No, I don't. I still have a piece of land that is worth whatever somebody says that it's worth. But I, the truth of the matter is when a buyer comes and takes it off your hands for that amount of money, then you've just made a gain. You've made a profit. But you don't, that's not, you're not in business, for example. You're not regularly turning a profit. You're just giving away something of value for money. Um, so... I wouldn't say collectible items are assets. They're just valuable things. Now, their value can rise significantly, but they are not paying you on a regular basis. So by that difference, I would say they don't fall in this definition of asset because we're saying an asset is something that puts money in your pocket regularly. On a regular basis, it doesn't have to be every month, it doesn't have to be every day, every week, but on a regular basis, this thing puts money in your pocket. It gives you money on a regular basis. And I stick to this definition because it's so important. If you don't sell the item, the collector's item, you have not gained any money. If you sell the collector's item, you no longer have that item. You no longer have the thing. You just have money, right? All you are benefiting is what is called in finance a capital gain. And the capital gain is not an asset. So can I ask you a question? Yeah. Yeah. So what do you say about passive income? You know? So passive, passive income, income. Passive yeah. income would definitely fall if it is passive income, it would definitely fall around, for example, a stock or bond or a, a business that you own or um, some shares in a business that you own. That would definitely whatever uh, asset class that gives you passive income, that is your asset. So the income itself is not the asset. It's the thing that gives you the passive income. That's the asset. So for example, you own, a, let's say you own 50% of, of uh, Amazon. 50% is massive. Let's say you own 1% of Amazon. Even 1% is massive. You own 1% of Amazon. That percentage of Amazon is your asset. How much it so, pays okay. you passive income so what yeah. if i have maybe a, a mercedes benz which we which will give me more income maybe in the next five years so is that a passive income or just you're still sticking on capital uh, capital gain how is the mercedes benz generating money for you in five years Are you renting that Mercedes? Oh, my internet has gone off. Hello, am I back? Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you now. There was a bit of a delay. Okay. Yeah, it's clear now. Yes. It, my, my computer was telling me that my internet connection is unstable. <laughs> so somebody was saying that they're going to make money from the Mercedes. Maybe I won't delay uh, on this question so that we can move forward, but if your Mercedes Benz, your Mercedes Benz is an asset if it is generating more money than it costs you. So it costs you paid money in taxes for it. Uh, it costs you money to maintain it. Let's say you're doing something with that Mercedes that makes money. For example, you're an Uber driver and the money that you are getting as an Uber driver using this Mercedes Benz is more than the overall money you've spent to get it, then it's an asset. 
if it generates more than it costs you, it's an asset, whatever it is. Uh, does does uh, do shares fall into the same class uh, as a plot of land? No. If you've bought shares, generally speaking, if you've bought shares that are uh, of, in a profitable business and uh, the shares are generally uh, spitting out a dividend or a I think I'm going to try to have a secure second uh, second uh, connection. So we were saying we were saying um, that liabilities are things that take money out of your pocket. Uh, things like cars, things like family holidays, things like luxury, things like food. Um, uh, rent liabilities like rent. Um, these are toys, adults uh, for adults and children. All of these are liabilities. We require liabilities to stay alive. Okay. Um, so there's nothing wrong with liabilities. Uh, I I I think that uh, I got some some poignant advice. Let's um, save our questions for the last uh, maybe 15 minutes of the session so that we can get through the content and go back to questions. Um, and if, if, you, if you absolutely can't hold on to it, please type your question in the chat box or try to get, get to it uh, before I get done. All right. So those are liabilities. Liabilities are not bad things. Liabilities are important things, at least a lot of the time. We need liabilities to live. Buying food is a liability. Paying rent for where you live uh, is a liability. Um, many things we pay for are liabilities, but we require them to stay alive. So liabilities aren't bad, um, and not all assets are good. And in fact, I wouldn't say li assets and liabilities are bad or good things. They're just things that we have to pay attention to. It's like saying, which one is bad, food or water? <laughs> I mean, none of them are bad. Too much food is bad. Too, too little water is bad. Too much water is bad. Um, but the items themselves, food and water, are not bad or good. They're just things that we need, just like we need assets and liabilities. We just have to manage them in a way that creates financial progress, as opposed to managing them in a way that causes us a financial decline. All right. Price is the third uh, essential financial term, and a price is whatever you pay for a good or service. Again, I'm using very broad personal finance definitions. Price is whatever you pay for a good or service. It's not, not always money, okay? Four is value. And value is what you get in exchange for what you pay. I always spend a lot of time on the difference between price and value. Understanding the relationship between price and value is so critical to becoming a good finance manager, personal finance manager. Many times when we spend money, we focus on how much things cost. And that's what you are giving away. When we spend our money, we should be focusing on what we get in exchange. This is also a biblical concept. When we give to God, we pay a price. There's a price to pay when you give to God. Anything. You give your 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 will you give yourself you give your sin you give your life when you do so you pay a price because you have to give something up and one of the things that we give up when we give to god is control or the illusion of control because none of us have any real control in this life but when we give to God, the re what we get back from God is always unfailingly so much more value than what we give up. We get so much more than what we give up when we give to God. Malachi says it himself. God says, test me. 
to see if my promise is not true about store, giving up uh, our tithes and offerings to the storehouse in heaven. So we must remember that when you give your broken heart to God, what he gives you back is so much greater in value than what you are giving up. But if we focus <clears throat> on the broken heart that we have, God, this is the only heart I have. God, you, you know, you told me to look, look to you when I want to make decisions. But I can see that this decision is better than that decision. I can see with my own eyes. You gave me a brain, I can, I can perceive that option A is better than option B. If you're telling me to let you make the choice for me, what if I don't like the outcome? I'm focused on what I'm paying, the cost. If I focus on the cost, I will forget and forego the blessing. We must focus on the value we get in exchange for what we pay. We should focus on what we get in exchange of what we pay in order to make good financial decisions. The parable goes that if you, a, a man found a treasure buried on a plot of land, as he worked that land, he would cover it up, go home, sell everything that he owns to come and buy this plot of land. Why would he do that? Why would he go and sell everything that he currently owns? Why would he sell everything that he currently owns in order to buy this land? The reason is that he understands everything he currently owns is not worth the value of what is in, buried in the ground on that land. So he will gladly give up everything he currently possesses to purchase the plot of land and the rights to what is buried on that land. Some of us are so focused on what we already have in this life, what we already possess, that we are losing focus of what we will get an eternity of bliss with God and a life of purpose and a life of value here on this earth if we will just give up what it is that we currently have. The broken, tattered things that we have now, we don't want to give them up. There's this image of a little girl holding a small teddy bear and God, Christ is asking for that little teddy bear with his hand open, knee down. And behind his back, he has a very big teddy bear. And his intention is to take that little broken teddy bear and give the little girl this very big, beautiful new teddy bear. But she's holding this, the one she has. I don't want to give it. There's a reason that God, that Christ spent so much time talking about money when he was on earth. Because we, our mindset, our state of mind when it comes to money relates to almost everything else in terms of resources in this life and where we put our hearts. So price and value, we must focus on what we get in exchange for what we pay. And when we make decisions where the value is much higher than the price, then we make good financial decisions. Number five is cash flow. And cash flow is the flow of money into and out of your pocket as it affects the available cash that you have. Cash flow. Think about water flowing in and out of a bucket with a hole at the bottom. If you have a faucet on full blast in pouring into a bucket with a small hole at the bottom, water will pour into the bucket and the bucket will slowly, in, uh, the level of water will slowly rise in the bucket, but some water will be pouring out. If the hole at the bottom of the bucket is smaller and the flow of water is less going out of the bucket than the flow of water going into the bucket, eventually the water level will rise. That is water flow. <coughs> now think about that example with your own money. Your money 
is the water and the faucet is your income and the small hole at the bottom of the bucket is your expenses if the hole is small water will ca cash will flow out of the small hole but if the inlet is heavy flow the while some cash will pour out the bucket the level of water in the bucket will eventually rise okay and that's called a positive cash flow and the reason i use this example is that you will never plug the hole of the bucket you have to spend there's no way you can live without spending you have to buy food you have to pay you have to pay for your needs but which way is it is the is it the faucet which has the heavy flow pouring to the bucket with a small hole or is it the faucet which has a small flow into a bucket with a big hole so the water is pouring out of the bucket very quickly which one is it for you does the water come out does your cash flow out of your pocket faster than it flows in if we understand cash flow then we know that we can't allow our bucket or whatever our pocket our bank account it cannot ever or it cannot constantly f f go negative go to zero it has to slowly not by big amounts but slowly it's, it has to increase the water in the bucket should slowly increase if we make good use of the flow of cash um, in and out of our pocket or our accounts find uh, the sixth uh, uh, important um, financial term is accountability and accountability is the record and balance of cause and effect with your money the record and the balance of cause and effect. What is the record of cause and effect with your money? Some people say I got paid this week. I had a hundred thousand in my pocket. I had a hundred dollars. I had a hundred pounds. I had two hundred pounds. I had two hundred dollars. I had two hundred thousand francs. But this weekend has gone, and I can't tell you where this money went. That's a lack of accountability. I don't know what I did with my money. It just it disappeared. What is the money? Unless it was stolen. Even if it was stolen, that's not disappearing. Somebody has it. You do not keep it safely. Accountability is a record of cause and effect. When I bought, I went shopping at the shopping market, I bought one, two, three, and I spent 10,000 francs or uh, $10 or 10 euros or whatever, and now I have a receipt that shows what I bought. And here are the items that I, 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 I bought there in my hand here in this bag. And I have the balance of the money in my account, in my pocket, on my phone, whatever. I'm accountable. If somebody was to ask me, I can tell them with this 100,000 francs, this is what I did. I had a plan to do one, two, three with 100,000. I got the 100,000 and I did one, two, three, here's the evidence. That's accountability. It's a record and a balance. Show me the receipt, show me a balance statement of the cause and effect. When I spent money, this is the effect of the spending. I'm accountable. It's a willingness to take a recorded responsibility of your actions a willingness to take recorded responsibility of your financial actions. And if it's not to somebody else, it's to yourself. How many of us can say what we did with the money? First of all, first of all how many of us can say how much money we made this year? Or can show it, let, let alone say it. This is the amount of money I made this year. Of the money I made this year, this is what I did with that money. And I can also tell you that I had a plan in the beginning of the year to do one, two, three. And if you look at what I did with my money, I accomplished one, two, three. After I sat down and I thought about one, two, three, what they are, what I need to do, I thought about it, I got money, and I used that money in a way that I had planned to use it. It was organized. Many of us can say we have an organized house. We are organized in our faith. I don't know if many of us can say that, but... There, there definitely are some. We are organized in our faith. We are organized in our responsibilities at work. We are organized with our role at home. 
How many of us are organized with the way we use our money and can prove it with evidence? The young people today say, how many of you have receipts? You have your receipts of what happened. I have proof. How many of us can do that? When we are accountable, we take ourselves so much closer to our financial goals because we are serious about record keeping of and, and balance keeping of cause and effect with the use of our money. We are willing to take recorded responsibility of our financial actions. That's being accountable. And lastly, wealth is not defined by how much money you make. It's defined by how much money you keep, how much you keep and what you do with it. One of the, the uh, conversations I recently had on my television, uh, sorry, my radio show, uh, I think a, a month or, or a month and a half ago, was talking about people who, who, win, who win money. Gamers, people, gamblers, people who, who do scratch cards and uh, who, who play games of chance. <clears throat> Las Vegas betters or sports betters. People who win money. In the first world, I think the, the statistics was in the United States, but it's a common trend globally. People who win money, within three years, 70% of them are broke. And after five years, above 90% of them are broke. And it doesn't matter how much money they have won. It does not matter how much money they have won Within three years, 70% are broke. Within five years, over 90% are broke. And it doesn't matter if it's $5,000, $25,000, $100,000, million, $100 million. There's a story of somebody who won $375 million broke within five years. How is that possible? If we are unable to tell the difference between the money that we make and the money that we keep and what we do with that money, we will never become wealthy. We will never become that promised righteous person. If in, in Proverbs 13, 22, if the money that we make is the same amount as the money that we spend. If we cannot keep some of the money we make, and use it constructively. Like the, the rich man and his three servants. It's not enough to keep the talent hidden in the ground. Yes, good that you kept the talent, but it's not enough to keep the talent. What did you do with it? At least you'd have put it in the bank so it can gain me an interest since you know I'm a wicked master who's always looking to reap where he didn't sow. I think I will stop my, my, uh, my session there because I believe we are close to time, about 15 minutes to the top of the hour. Um, I will uh, hand it back to the microphone, back to um, Elder David. Uh, and uh, and uh, pastor, um, if there are any questions, I think we have time for that. But I will stop there so I can give time for questions. Please let us remember, if anything, in this session, that unless we determine the difference between what we need and what we want, unless we find a way to mature financially with our financial decisions, to to cover our needs with our money. And then some of our wants, focus on keeping some of the money we make a tenth of it and finding something productive to do with that tenth of what we make, then we will slowly and steadily build wealth of generations. It's a very simple formula and it works every time. Thank you very much for, for, for joining me in this conversation. I hope you gain some value for the price of time that you have paid. I hope that the value that you have received is far greater than the price of time and attention that you have paid to be here, because that would be a wise financial decision. Uh, be blessed, everyone. Be blessed, you too. 
Uh, thanks, Isaac. Uh, every time Isaac presents, and I'm fortunate to attend his presentations, I, I learn something new. And today I've learned quite uh, a lot in, in terms of financial management, and personal finances. Uh, you know, the highlight for me is it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much money you have. Um, what matters is how much money you are able to save. And for you to be able to save, you really need to know what an asset is, what a liability is, and calculate your cash flow very well using that very simple analogy. So thank you. Um, let's have questions and answers. And this is going to be moderated by uh, David Manzi. So David, over to you.